Hello, and welcome to today's Autodesk Build Your Moldflow IQ webinar series. Thank you for joining us. Before we dive into today's topic, I'd like to review a few logistics. First, we have an hour, we have an hour time slot booked for this. However, the intent is to present and demo during the first 20 to 40 minutes. Then we will take the remaining time for live Q&A. Throughout the webinar, you may enter in your questions using GoToWebinar's questions section. Any questions that we cannot answer during the webinar, we ask you to please post these within the Moldflow Insight Forum, and either myself or one of our other experts will help with answering. This webinar will be recorded and we will be posting it to the Simulation Community website shortly, shortly after. Today, we will be reviewing how to utilize Autodesk Moldflow Insight towards understanding the benefits of costly mold designs to justify potentially high tooling costs associated with those. As a quick introduction, my name is Kristen Kilroy, and I'm a plastics engineer who has worked with the Moldflow products at Autodesk for over six years now. Beginning on the technical support team, it's great to see familiar names on the call today, and I'm excited for those new ones that I'm seeing too. Currently, I'm working on the simulation marketing team, performing both technical and product marketing for Moldflow software, as well as our other simulation products, Helios PFA, Composites, and CFD. As mentioned, Today we will be discussing the use of Moldflow to help justify tooling costs. We'll do a brief overview of tool design and review why there is that need to validate with Moldflow simulation. Next, we'll take a deep dive into one example of a costly mold tooling option, conformal cooling, and run through an example. After running through some final tips and tricks for validating tooling with Moldflow, we'll go through some live Q&A. So when we take a look at a mold design, uh, the mold designer first looks into quoting a mold build. There are several details that help them into determining the ultimate cost of the tool. An old coworker of mine would joke and say that the most expensive mold is actually the one that has to be reworked because ultimately it could have not been planned for or there could have been troubleshooting issues that were a result of poor planning. So getting as many details as possible up front is critical for budgeting accordingly. Now we're not looking into any actual costs today as Autodesk doesn't actually build or quote molds. Um, this is more on your expertise as, as well as uh, the industry itself. So this will be more to align our thinking so that we can start to understand how to look at a mold flow insight simulation to make educated predictions on justifications of making those potentially costly mold design choices. I've listed a few more basic considerations here to get things rolling, and I do want to reiterate that these are some examples, as there are many more things that you can look at when quoting a mold build. Some of these you might also not need for your, your specific simulation. So looking into the plastic part itself, including the size of the part, material type? Are there necessary undercuts that do require those advanced tooling options? As well as how many parts are you actually molding? How long does this mold have to last? We can build a mold out of aluminum if we wanted to. It'll be quick, easy, but it wouldn't really last too long. And for a lot of larger parts, the pressures might not be able to uh, hold up to the aluminum. Part quality and tolerance requirements also play factors. So steel safe areas that do require reworks afterwards, um, is that tolerance so tight that we're not really able to work with it? And then our surface finish requirements, very high for this part because it's gotta be visually aesthetic. So what sort of things do we have to work on within the tool itself in order to achieve those? Looking into the feed system, this is kind of a no brainer, you know, where's the gate going to be placed that could also influence the cost of the tooling if you have to add hot runner manifold system or valve gates as well as the number of gates if you have to drill more more out of that steel 
that could play into the cost of the tool. Moving into the mold requirements themselves, are we gonna do a family tool? Is there gonna be additional cavitation? Adding additional cavitation might save in the long run on the manufacturing side of things, but on the initial mold cost, that will certainly play factor as they'll have to cut out more cavities. Looking into the mold material itself, will we have to add any inserts that are in critical areas that really have to pull that heat out? as well as what is the cycle time requirement? How much does that um, mold ultimately have to produce, which goes along with the number of parts molded? Is it gonna be able to achieve that cycle time requirement? So all of these play factor. Um, let's dive into a real quick example. So if we want to compare quoting molds for a medical single use syringe versus say a plastic spoon, and you can see a, a quick picture of both of these shown here. The cost behind the molds for both of these really depend on the similar on similar variables as in the last slide I just showed. Let's say both the syringe and the spoon had requirements for a 32 cavity mold. However, due to the syringe's geometry being a little bit more complex, it's got that really deep well that it's gotta get that core into and ultimately eject the part from that core. The general starting cost might be a little higher for that syringe. Actually, it will be. <laughs> um, looking at the tool, tool designer, they know right off the bat that the syringe would require baffles in each of those cavities, whereas the spoon's cooling for all 32 cavities would probably ach be achieved with a very simple, straightforward drilled channel design. Additionally, the syringe probably has a much tighter tolerance requirement, given that it is in a medical field. So this would require some steel safe dimensions possibly in order to account for maybe core deflection that could have happened in a long uh, core like that. Now let's say these molds were built and the manufacturer notices that the spoon mold is not achieving an acceptable cycle time there is a chance that, that the actual tool cost may increase more than the syringe cost because you have to rework all these things. You might have to rework that feed system as mentioned, um, maybe jump in there and figure out a better cooling system to uh, be able to meet that cycle time. So extract that heat quickly. Because for something like that, you're well, both of these parts, you're producing a lot of parts at a time. 32 cavities is a lot of parts. So you need that cycle time to be pretty minimal considering what the ultimate volumes might be in the millions. This is where simulation for both of these cases, while they were in the planning stage, would help to minimize that unexpected cost, that rework cost, that maybe advanced tooling design that maybe we could prove it out with simulation that we don't need that costly mold. So with that, I want to hop over to a more, more in-depth specific example topic that I chose to focus on in the advanced tooling portion of this webinar, which is conformal cooling. Whether it's improving cooling of efficiency within the spoon mold or reducing the core deflection within the syringe mold, learning how design affects these before building the mold itself is a huge advantage to justifying, justifying the potential increased mold costs. This is where simulation can help, clearly defining what goal or goals that you have for running through those advanced tooling options and making those costly design changes will help to set the stage for the mold flow simulation. Something like specifying a nominal value to what cycle time do you need to make or manufacture X number of parts so the mold cost amortization is acceptable when adding conformal cooling. Or understanding the part quality rejects, rejection rates of a non-induction heated tool can be used when you analyze the mold flow simulation to identify if, say, a surface defect might be resolved with the addition of 
induction heating. What about considering adding something like overmolding to re prevent the need for secondary operations? That could also be some a specific need for simulation to test it out first, and then you'll be able to circle back and, and prove those out with the simulation. Each of these scenarios, along with others that I may not have included, can use multiple simulation to ask the big question, which is if making that advanced process or design adjustment will influence the end product enough that it will offset the upfront costs of that injection mold, why not do it? Let's test it out, let's experiment. So as I mentioned, uh, I wanted to take a closer look at conformal cooling because recently it's been gaining more and more popularity path through the, throughout the past few years. Conformal cooling involves designing the cooling system of either a section of a mold or the entire mold cavity or core that the channels follow the cavity walls to uniformly cool around the cavity or around the part. A molded part's quality is reliant on the thermal history of polymer at all stages of the molding process. So using conformal cooling to help promote a more even temperature distribution within the mold can ultimately help to improve the part quality, along with other advantages, such as optimized cycle time. In the past, these types of conformal channels would be manufacturers and segments, almost cutting up the core in order to drill in those channels that would conform to the part cavity. They would then have to be matched precisely together and then either soldered or welded together, which would prove for maybe an iffy uh, lifespan for that cavity because it is being cut up. So this would be a very time consuming and costly process just to create these conformal channels within a mold. Within the past five to 10 years, I don't know exactly when it was, I had to look into that a little bit more for you guys. Um, direct metal laser sintering, DMLS, has been something that has been growing in popularity and technology. So because of this, which is also referred to 3D printing of metal, we're able to incorporate that flexibility of having maybe one of these DMLS machines at a tool designer or tool builder who are able to do it on site and build these cavities in a more uh, quali qualified and uh, sustainable manner than the previous welding of segments of a core together. Although it typically requires some post-processing as well, such as polishing or else drilling through, say, ejector pinholes, this method has been going down in price because of that, that technology growing in the field. But although ad additive manufacturing is growing to a point where these 3D printers are now in many tool shops that you might be working with every day, the process can still be time consuming and costly, which is something that can be a benefit from simulating first within Moldflow to understand its influence and if it's worthwhile to add to your tooling designs. So let's take a look at an example of a conformal cooling case study. We have the sample part of an automotive water pump housing. This may look familiar to those who have watched the recording of my Autodesk University presentation about two years ago, but hopefully it'll be a good tie into this conformal to cooling talk and advanced tooling. Now on this part, the majority of the heat was where the center large ribs met with that center cylindrical feature of the part. Because this part is also being gated at the center top of that cylinder, that's where a lot of heat is being introduced. And to efficiently pull that heat out, as we could see here, the ribs are thicker than the nominal wall thickness of the rest of the part. It's gonna be a challenge. 
So let's take a look at how simulation might be able to help us out here. So for this design here, the mold designer did a quick down and dirty cooling system for it, which we don't particularly like due to its lack of uniform cooling across the part. Um, you can see it's very basic in there. Um, but we decided to test the idea of conformal cooling channels next. Not being too familiar with the construction, we decided to model them really uh, to really conform with the geometry of the bottom face of the part and the salinity feature, trying to pull that heat away from those ribs. And I'll go ahead and replay that for you here. Um, as a guideline, it's ideal to stay under a delta of about 5 degrees Celsius for semi-crystalline materials and 10 degrees Celsius for amor amorphous materials when you're looking at temperature distribution across the part. So looking at this, um, we are seeing not too bad, but because of those hot spots around the rib region, it is a concern. So let's go ahead and see what we can do to move forward with optimizing that cooling design. And again, this is an ABS part, so we're looking for that 10 degree difference. So since we didn't really like that original super simplified cooling channel design, we decided to model a more realistic machined channel design. So this would be kind of something that you might get back from your tool designer. Um, it's still not optimal, but we wanted to just show you the options. And again, you can see here, this is using baffle in the center to extract that heat from that center core because of the gate being there, because of those thick ribs. With this design, we essentially tried to duplicate or replicate a conformal feel to it because you can see here it is trying to get into the nooks and crannies of the top of the part as well as that internal part. And we hoped to really pull that heat out, but we could see here there's still a few hot spots that, you know, the only way to find out if there's a benefit from the addition of conformal cooling would be to actually test it out. So we went ahead and ran through a conformal cooling simulation. So here I'm just going to walk you briefly through the simulation portion within Moldflow Insight. Um, with the part imported, the mold cavity or the cooling channels were then added uh, to the study. You can see here we added both 3D as well as lip lines or curves and the curve sim or the simplified channels on the top of the mold. But we can have both within this study because of Moldflow's solver capabilities. Now they can't necessarily connect to one another, but for instances like this where this, the cavity cooling might be simplified compared to the conformal, then that could be a, a great benefit because it saves solver time. Now, after meshing everything, the channel, channel inlets are assigned here. Again, this is because of the complexity of the solvers, being able to identify where that inlet and outlet is on the part is especially critical for the conformal section where you might have several flow paths for that water. Adding the mold boundary is sufficient for this uh, specific case study, just because we're doing it as a brief example. Um, ideally, you would want to try to import your cavity and core uh, so you have a, rough, a better estimate and more accurate results of the size of the tool as well as the heat distribution within that mold itself. After adding the gates, we also added the material. Um, and you can see here, we could just search for the one that we're looking for. And in this case, like I mentioned, it is going to be that material there. And looking through all of the material properties is always a good idea just to make sure, one, that it's measured data. If you see any red in there, that means it's not necessarily measured for that specific material. It would just be for a more generalized material. So keeping an eye on that for accuracy's sake um, is always a benefit. Now, setting up the 
uh, cool FEM settings, uh, we went through and stuck with the transient from uh, startup option, which will provide additional results for us. So you're not just getting a quick preview of the results in the long run. What it's actually going to do is cycle by cycle. So we're going to see that heat build up if it is building up in the tool um, after several cycles, rather than the other options, which would be more of an average of that heat distribution. Now the rest of the settings here, since we are comparing it to those other two de cooling designs, we did go through and match it, uh, make sure they just aligned with the same settings that we used for those other ones. And then including part quality is always a good good call when you're when that's something to consider with tool designs. Running the analysis. And then we'll jump into the results here. Now, looking from the results, the conformal channels are flowing nicely. You can see here the temperature distribution. It's uh, not too wide when we look at it. And then the part temperature shows that the corners that weren't really getting much heat extracted before on the previous uh, examples, they're really getting uh, cooled down with this conformal design. You can see a side shot of the mold thermal cycling here. So here's a small animation that we created just to show exactly what that water is doing in there. So it's flowing through those channels all up and around. And again, for any cooling channels, you do want that turbulent, turbulent flow. And from the uh, previous slide with the video showing the temperature distribution, we didn't see any true hot spots in that cooling design. And I can switch back to it here so we could take another quick look at it. Um, but realistically, it was, pull up the temperature here. Yeah, so this shot here, um, all of these are fairly uniform and the temperature distribution here is less than five degrees. It's about four and a half, which is ideal. As mentioned before, we're looking for under 10 degrees because of the material of choice. Whereas I think we made it with this conformal design. So jumping ahead here, um, how do we actually compare these? So looking at the results, since we were comparing three identical parts, just different uh, cooling designs, we were able to find the temperature or the uh, time to reach ejection temperature um, throughout the three parts. And noticing that there was still hot spots, were still hot spots within that rib section. And you can see the arrows pointing to those sections in this slide here. Um, however, look at those uh, time to reach ejection temperature times. We're almost having it from the simple channels to the conformal channels. That's pretty significant if you're looking to really prove this out to your customers or to your boss or whoever's holding that budget in hand wanting to know why you want to go that route. Now, just to confirm these findings, I wanted to take a deeper look into probing each of these side by side so that we have a duplicate point that we're measure, measuring each against. So here we are looking at it face down, top down, um, at the part with a cross section through that rib section through the center of that cylinder. Um, you can see we have a few probes here and I just enlarged it with the queried spot, spot referenced in the bottom. Um, and even here, you can see it is almost more than half at that point with 75 seconds for the conformal cooling in that same spot that basic cooling is showing about 185 seconds to reach ejection temperature. Now, realistically, when you're looking at manufacturing this part, given the part thickness and how little of material is really showing that it's still at a melt temperature here, um, it's probably okay to eject this part earlier. However, in some cases that might not be the case. You might have to wait for a structural component of a part to cool or solidify completely before being able to eject it. So being able to simulate it like this is really helpful for understanding that 
cooling process that that uh, plastic is going through during your uh, analysis. All right, and now to wrap things up here today, um, some key takeaways to keep in mind for the next time either you or you are quoting a project or you're sending a part out to the mold designer for a quote, um, just to keep in the back of your mind when you're doing so. Um, first off, always remember that you can use, use these mold flow simulations early on in the design process. Do it even before sending it out to the design or to get the part and tool designed, or excuse me, get the tool designed. <laughs> Um, you do need the part, obviously, because you need to understand all the components that are associated with it within, like mentioned in one of the earlier slides that listed all those different variables that could be factored into it. This can ultimately help prevent wasted time if you find out that the, the desired design that you're looking at is either not worth the expense or if it'll make you a hero. It might be that saving grace that you've been looking for, trying to figure out how to uh, meet all these meet all these tolerances or um, requirements from your customer to be able to provide them a quality part. And this isn't just for conformal design. This was just a case study that I pulled up for us to associate it with today. Um, this could be associated with, say, mold inserts. It could be uh, induction heating, as referenced earlier. Um, so many other things, even uh, doing something like geometry changes on the part itself. You might have to look at thinner walls or things like that. Just because something worked the same uh, or worked to the same time or money on a previous tool does not mean it will do the same on other molds. So each mold is different. Understanding what that uh, differences when receiving a part will help to uh, simulate it within Moldflow. And don't just say yes to include a design because it's convenient. Um, say someone has an insert that could fit your syringe tool uh, and you want to just give it a try. You have to know what you're trying to improve upon in, and quantify it in order to get those results that you're really looking for. In order to be that hero at the end, you want to be able to justify why you did it and explain the process so it could be replicated in the future. Replicate it in a way to help save you your project uh, money, your company money, your customers money, and so forth. And as we did in the case study, seeing the cycle time reduction is a proven cost saver as the manufacturer can mold their quota for parts in less time, allowing either higher quantities to be produced at that particular molder or with that mold. Maybe you might be considering doing two different or two molds running at the same time to meet your quota. You might not have to do that if you're able to save this, this much cycle time. And with that, I wanted to thank you all for joining us today. Um, I hope this was helpful in planning future projects and starting to experiment within Moldflow simulations in order to justify those not so cheap, non-standard costs that you might see popping up here and there on different projects. Um, as mentioned, we will follow up within the next day or so with a recording of this webinar. Uh, email directly to you since you did register for it. We do have your emails. Um, and I'll also include a reference sheet for conformal cooling since that's one of the topics we talked about today. And we will post this webinar on the Autodesk Simulation Community website for you to share with whomever would be interested if you've got coworkers you want to show and so forth. The next Build, build Your Moldflow IQ will be October 29th, and it will focus on reviewing you, the use of Moldflow. Um, Moldflow Insight Design of Experiments for Quality Improvements. You can sign up for this through the Plastics Monthly Newsletter that many of you have received, uh, the webinar events section of the Autodesk website, 
or through my forum post for these Build Your Moldflow uh, webinars. And all you have to do is just search Build Your Moldflow IQ and it should pop up shortly after. And now we'll hop into a few minutes of live Q&A, but if there's anything that it's not answered here today, I just wanna remind you, um, please do follow up with us on the Moldflow Insight forums and we'll, either myself or the, the Moldflow team will be happy to help you. Thank you all again for joining us and we hope to see you next time.